I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about lead and ADHD. What's the connection? As usual, I'll start with the take-home message. The take-home message is that lead is one of the clearest cases of environmental factors contributing to ADHD. More than a dozen studies support this. We've known that lead has been a poison since the days of the Romans, and one of the organs that's most susceptible is the brain, and particularly brains of developing children are most susceptible. And it's not just ADHD that there's a number of studies showing a clear dose-dependent relationship with lead, lead levels and decreased IQ, greater impulsivity, poor emotional control, greater hyperactivity, poor attention, and actually full-blown ADHD. Part of why this is in the news right now, this is April of 2025, is a study fairly recently showed from looking at core samples of old glaciers that the smelting of silver, silver smelting and mining in the time of the Romans for a couple centuries almost certainly led to increases in blood levels across most of Europe, increases of three or four micrograms per deciliter. That's a significant increase compared to background levels. And that that probably corresponded to a population-wide decrease in IQ of somewhere in the two to four point range. So not a huge impact for each individual, but a measurable and detrimental impact on society at large. Lead is normally in its natural state locked into ores in the Earth's surface, so it's not usually harming people. And humans tended to stumble across it in the early days when they were looking for silver. So many of the best sources of silver, silver isn't usually found in pure nuggets in the ground, but isn't ores such as galena and Galena is actually a lead ore that has a little silver in it. So galena is 86% lead, give or take, with at most 1% silver and often half a percent or just a tenth of a percent. So when you are mining for silver, you are churning out and going through a whole bunch of lead and releasing lead into the environment where it can be poisoning people. But when they realized some of lead's properties, lead itself became something that was sought after and industrially produced by the standards of the Roman era. So what are the attributes of lead that make it so desirable? One, it's really dense. And that density makes it a good use for plumb bobs. So plumb bobs is a weight on a string that architects use to measure what's a true vertical. Plumb comes from Latin word plumbum, which is lead. If you've wondered why in the heck on the periodic charts is lead PB has nothing to do with peanut butter, sinkers in fishing, ammunition, and shooting it in a bullet, you cause more damage if you have a heavier pellet when it hits the body. Not only is it dense, it's fairly soft and malleable. We'll get to that. It's also the density leads to why it's still used in shields for radiation when you're getting dental x-ray or other x-rays. The density packing of the atoms means that it's hard for wavelengths of radiation to penetrate and harm human organs. So not only is it dense, it's quite malleable. So if you melt lead and pour it into a sheet. You can bend that sheet and beat it into shape for plumbing and make it a nice tube. You can make it into goblets or other eating ware. And it's also tends to be non-corrosive, for example, in, compact, in contrast to steel. So that again makes it a good choice for plumbing. That's why it was, along with its electrical properties, used in lead acetate batteries. So again, they're fairly stable, not going to be corroded easily. Certain salts of lead are very colorful and they hold bright colors for a long period of time. So it's used in paints and cosmetics and paints not only holds bright whites, bright yellows, reds, it dries quickly. And when it dries, it's relatively moisture resistant. Again, it was used in cosmetics and the Roman times. It was also used as a sweetener in wines and alcoholic drinks and preservative for some food. Again, that's part of why particularly the Roman elite seems to have had higher levels of lead and may have led to some of the insanity and eccentricity of some of the late Roman empires. But in the U.S. and much of the industrialized world, the biggest source of lead contamination in the last century was organic lead. So when lead is combined with certain number of carbon atoms, that's an organic lead. And in the 1920s, just a decade or so after the Model T rolled off the assembly lines for the first time, it was found that lead 
added to gasoline was an effective no-knocking agent. What the heck is knocking? So in the internal combustion engine, you have a compressor where you are combining hot, gaseous forms of the fuel or gasoline with hot air. You're compressing it and exposing it to a spark plug. When electrical charge goes to the spark plug, that creates a controlled explosion. However, if you have hot gas under pressure, hot flammable gas, it can explode prematurely. That premature explosion is what's called knocking, and it can damage the engine as well as greatly reducing the efficiency of the energy you're effectively getting out of that fuel. Lead compounds were found to reduce those premature explosions very effectively. Mid-70s, the median level of lead in the blood across America was around 15.8 micrograms per deciliter. Now, in those days, the CDC's level of concern was a pretty high 30 micrograms per deciliter. But as more and more studies turned in, pretty quickly it was clear anything above 10 looked like dangerous in terms of leading to lower IQ in kids who were exposed when they were young to that level or had levels of lead in their blood in that range. And again, higher rates of ADHD. And the more we've looked, even lower levels. So the level of concern now, according to the CDC, is closer to three micrograms. Anyway, the EPA, starting in 1973, issued declarations to start decreasing lead levels in gasoline, phasing them out fairly quickly. By 1980 or so, the median level had already dropped from 15.8 micro micrograms per deciliter to just below 10, and it's continued to drop steadily. It actually was dropped pretty quickly in the late 70s to early 80s. For the last decade or so, the mean level of lead in humans' blood in America is less than one microgram per deciliter by 0.7, so less than 5% of what it was 40, 50 years ago. In China, the biggest source of lead in the blood is coal burning. And that's clearly a bigger source. I mean, they also outlawed lead in gasoline. They put restrictions as we did on house paint. The question is, why would the current administration want to be trying to catch up to China or compete with China in terms of putting more lead into our air so we contaminate of coal or coke, which is a form of coal used in other steel manufacturing? Most of it does have some lead contamination. Trump's bill is called the reinvigorating the beautiful, clean coal industry. Whether it's beautiful or not, that's a subjective judgment. Whether it's clean is absolutely coal is not clean. And in addition to trying to boost coal burning in this country, soliciting exemptions from restrictions on how much lead, how much arsenic, encouraging dirtier coal burning. And one of the ironies, separate from whether this is good for global warming, which it clearly isn't, the demise of the coal industry is largely for economic reasons, not because of environmental restrictions, not because of forcing to burn it more clearly. It's just that it takes a huge amount of manpower to dig coal out of the ground. You can't pump it. You can't frack it out of the ground. It's just labor intensive and dirty and harmful to the mine workers. So it's economic issue. We're not really going to bring coal back anyway. So most lead poisoning in the U.S. today is more localized and sporadic. We're not putting it in the gasoline everywhere. And even, even in the days of leaded gasoline, it was locales where lots of cars were or lots of gas stations were or where refineries were that had higher concentrations. So again, the 15.8 was a median, half of people below it, half above it. So most of the cases of lead poisoning today are things like kids eating paint chips. Many old houses have layers of leaded paint underneath, and if it isn't maintained, surface layers can chip off and lead can be exposed. Or if the building is remodeled with the remediation efforts, it could be lead in the dust in the yard or in the soil. Again, lead is not going to degrade. It's going to be sitting there forever. Another, again, more localized is more than 9 million water main mines, according to the EPA, still use lead. That's more than 9 million families being affected by having their water going through lead pipes. Again, lead is generally not corrosive, but depending on the acidity and other aspects of lead, can make less lead leach out of it. 
There have been a couple scares or recalls of products, applesauce just a year ago, where high levels of lead, and that was from traced back to cinnamon contamination. Periodically, there's reports of both lead and cadmium in dark chocolate. These are not intentionally lacing this with the product. It's that the agricultural practices with chocolate and the lead exposure, it seems to be when the sticky cacao beans are exposed to high dust and dust that has a lot of lead in it. And it's been found that African produced chocolates tend in general to have lower lead levels than South American, where there is more silver mining and silver mining strong correlation with lead exposure. There's also been cases of marijuana and other street drugs that were laced intentionally with lead to increase the weight of the product. So someone was thinking they were getting more of their drug of abuse. California condor is a bird that's largest wingspan, largest flying birds in North America, brought back sort of from the edge of extinction, but so on the edge. And the biggest threat in periling them is eating game that's been shot with lead ammunition and they ingest the lead and poison accumulates in their body and they either die directly or they have neurologic and other problems. Once lead's in the environment, it's not degrading over time. It may be blown to different areas or swept around, particularly its organic form. It's well absorbed from touching lead dust, from inhaling lead dust. So both the lungs and the skin are good ways of absorbing it. What does it do once it's in the body? Lots of enzymes in the body use metals such as copper or iron or magnesium as cofactors to catalyze to make biochemical reactions happen more readily. Lead is metal and it can bind to many of these enzymes, but it doesn't create an active form of the enzyme. It inactivates. So many of the problems physically and part of why the problems are so widespread is because lots of enzymes that can interfere with lots of biochemical processes. In addition to that, lead does readily cross the blood brain barrier and it binds to and interferes specifically among other things with glutamate receptors in the forebrain. As I've talked about in other videos, that's particularly important for ADHD. So the toxicity of lead, and I'm sort of covering a broad spectrum from lead poisoning which some would reserve for acute massive doses, but I would say the whole range is lead poisoning. Depends on the dose. It depends on the duration, how long you're exposed. It depends on the age and the other health of the individual. So there's lots of factors. Your body can excrete lead, but it does it pretty slowly and efficiently. So lead tends to accumulate in bones and teeth. And people with particularly high levels need to be given special chelating agents. So in terms of lead poisoning, most of the symptoms are pretty vague and nonspecific and could happen from a number of different causes. So it can cause gastrointestinal problems, particularly constipation, abdominal pain, nausea, can cause headaches and damage red blood cells and cause anemia, cause kidney or liver failure, cause failure or lethargy, seizures, can cause ADHD, emotional dysregulation, hyperactivity, impulsivity. So getting to the ADHD literature, there are more than a dozen studies that have correlated lead exposure with the later development of ADHD. Now, these are not, for the most part, randomly controlled trials. So it's very hard. We can't prove cause and effect, but some that strongly, strongly support a cause and effect role. One is that there's a dose-response relationship. The higher levels of blood, the greater the likelihood of developing ADHD by mid-childhood. Two is the well-done studies try to control for confounding variables. I mean, we know, again, particularly, you know, where were lots of gasoline station, gas station, where were lots of automobiles in inner city environments where lower levels of income, lower levels of education, other factors that could confound it. So the well-done studies try to control for those factors and still find an impact or correlation with blood and lead levels and later development of ADHD. We also have what are called naturalistic studies. So examining people who live right near smelters, different plumbing situations in different communities can be compared to see if other factors seem to be the same and one still has lead pipes and they have higher levels of lead and higher levels of ADHD. 
animal models also support that lead levels can be toxic to the brain and particularly damaging to the frontal cortex. There is also some damage or some evidence that lead levels can damage serotonergic systems and may be associated with depression and mood disorders. Now, it should be acknowledged that not absolutely every study that's looked for a correlation between blood levels or lead levels and subsequent ADHD has found an association. More than a majority, it's a preponderance of studies have, but a handful have not found that association. But the authors of several different meta-analyses conclude that in general, the ones that haven't found a connection tend to be among the most poorly designed or less rigorously done, including things like using urine levels, which are not as good a marker of, of lead load as blood levels are and are not as accurate a marker, or other not controlling as well for confounding other variables. Almost certain that we have actually averted millions of cases of ADHD by the lowering of lead that went on, again, through eliminating it from gasoline in the mid-70s. Of note, jet engines don't use gasoline, but propeller planes still are allowed to use leaded gasoline. There are alternatives that are slightly more expensive than adding lead, prevent knocking in propeller plane engines. One of the more charged or controversial topics is that Despite what many fear mongers claim that we are in the midst of a huge crime wave, the rates of violent crimes, murder and other violent crimes are about a third, so three times lower now than they were in the late 1980s. Late 1980s correlates with about a 20 year lag from the peak of lead poisoning from gasoline. There is a fairly widely accepted association among sociologists, criminologists, that a substantial part of the massive crime wave in the U.S. that was witnessed in the 80s, 90s, was the fallout from toxic levels of lead in our environment. This is a pattern that's seen in other countries, and even the critics who attack this model have conceded in print that probably somewhere between at least 8 to 25 percent of the excess rate of murders we're seeing in those years was attributable to lead poisoning. So again, part of this research is difficult because there's confounding factors, but it really should raise concern that we are taking more measures now to again add lead into our air with burning more coal. Most of the ADHD research community you know, just accepts that it contributes to real cases of ADHD. So cases that are developing early in childhood, again, persist through the lifetime. Even if you subsequently do bring down the lead levels within that individual, they've caused changes or damage early in the life. But many of these experts will say that if you get head trauma or you get long COVID or you replicate ADHD symptoms late in life, that that's secondary ADHD and not real ADHD. And yet in both cases, again, for any individual, it's genetics and environment acting together, but clearly lead is the primary or major contributor or pusher of that individual into an ADHD realm. So I would just question why we sort of are routinely accepting that as genuine ADHD and others secondary. That's all for today. So thanks for listening.